first of all, I just wanted to thank you for being here in Detroit. Uh, we're really blessed to have you, and I think everybody is showing as much love as we can. Yeah. Another round of applause. Thank you. And he taught class at Wayne State, so he's, he's embedded in our community, and we love that. Um, but wanted to get right into some questions. You know, we've sure. been talking about you know, the awards that you've won over the years, you know, MacArthur Genius Fellow, like we're sitting with a genius, right? How often does that happen? <laughs> um, but before we start talking about the film, what I thought we'd do is talk about you a little bit. Okay. Um, and the first thing that came to my mind, I said, what would be my first question? And the first question is, what made you want to be a filmmaker? Um, you know, I grew up in, in the 1950s and the 1960s. Uh, when you know uh, African Americans were not on TV at all, you know, not in the movies at all, um, and the the thought of being behind the camera was like, you know, the thought of going to Mars or something. You know, it was just not happening. Um, but then, you know, in the late '60s, early '70s, as I was in college, all of a sudden, you know, these black exploitation films films came out, and things started to open up a little bit, and. Um, you know, the, the films that were coming out were not about the people that I knew, you know? I mean, you know, my father was a dentist. My, my mother was a librarian, you know? And that's the community I grew up with. And uh, I thought that there was room for more stories about African Americans, that, you know, the African American community is not monolithic, that right. it's varied. And so um, I took a film class and liked it, and that was about it. Yeah, and that's what it sparks. What, what was your first documentary? What was that? Uh, the first major film I made was Two Dollars in a Dream, which is the story of Madam C.J. Walker and Alilia Walker. Your mom um, had a connection, uh, right? Right, right. Well, my, grand, my mother's father um, was Madam C.J. Walker's business partner and attorney. And um, I, I, he had passed away before I was born, so I never met him. But it was a story I had always heard, and so my family was kind of embedded in the Walker Company. And uh, you know, I think that it's important for people making their first film is to make a film that they can make, you know, like not to try to do your first film to be the history of Christianity or, you know, you know, or something like that. You know, do a film that you can do. And so because my family had been kind of part of the Madam C.J. Walker Company, um, it was a film that I could do, and so that was the first film I made. That's awesome, awesome. You see, the history is always connected. Um, I don't ask traditional questions, but when did you know you were good? I mean, don't be humble. When did you know that you were really good? Um, what was that moment? I, 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 don't, I don't, I think, you know, maybe just now is when I'm realizing <laughs> that, you like know, that, right? um, you know, because, I mean, the thing about it is that, you know, uh, filmmaking is really hard. Making any kind of film is really hard. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think, the one thing, you know, I try to say to people, you know, it's like writing a book, you know? So you write one good book. You know, you write a book, it's really good. Right. Does that mean the next book you write is gonna be any good? No, you know, it's, it, it, it's each, one is, each one is different. So a lot of times, you know, um, you know I, I, um, I, I live, you know, and, and I work off of fear, you know, uh, because I'm, you know, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm trying to, you know, I'm making, you know, a film about black colleges, you right. know? There has never been one. There may never be another one, at least for a while, there won't be. You know, I'm doing, making a film about the Black Panthers, you know, Emmett Till, you know, um, you know, I feel like, you know, there's ancestors sitting on my shoulder saying, don't mess this up, Stanley. You know, right, right. Don't, don't mess this up. You know, you know when, you, when you mention those films, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind, if Stanley didn't do it, who would have told those stories? And I wonder about the barriers and the challenges that you had to overcome to even do that. Talk a little bit about that. Well, you know, it, it's funny because, you know, uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, people will, will, will talk about these subjects like they're hard subjects or that, you know, um, you know, they're somehow, you know, uh, taken on some, you know, but to me, these are just great, interesting stories. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, what's more, you know, fascinating than the Black Panthers, you know? Right. Like, like, you know, that's all you gotta say is, you know, here's a film on the Black Panthers. You wanna go see it? Nobody's gonna say no, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think, I don't think I wanna see that. I, you know, uh, I wanna see the new Star Wars movie. Um, so, you know, I, I so, you know, it, these, these are not difficult subjects to me. You know, they're, they're, they're films that I, that I really want to make. I think that, you know, when I, when I made uh, the film on Madam, Wal Madam C.J. Walker, Two Dollars in a Dream, it took me seven years to get the film made, you know, and, and after the film 
you know, aired and was and it was on it was on TV, and I was like, okay, now I made it, you know. And the next film took me seven years to make right. again, you know. And, and I realized that, you know, you don't when you go into these projects, you don't know how long it's going to take. So for me, it's really essential that it's something that's important to me. Yeah. You know, that I'm working on subjects that I feel are important because it might take me seven years to get the film done. It might take me ten years to get the film done. Um, uh, Tell them we are rising. We were thinking about that film for years. You know, we probably thought about the film for five or six years, and then another couple of years to raise the money, and then another couple of years in production. So, right. you know, those films take a long time. So, you know, I, I don't look at them as like difficult films. I mean, I think they're they're they're, they're big stories. They're stories about you know us as African Americans. They're they're stories about you know uh, this country, this nation. They're, they're stories about this world that I think are, should be important to everybody. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. I, I remember we were talking earlier before we came in here and I told you when I first saw the film, I didn't want it to stop. I wanted it to keep going. And the first thing that came to my mind is, is that, you know, I wonder what inspired him to pick this topic. Because there's a lot of topics, right? What was so unique about this topic that you had to tell this story? Well, I, I think there's, there's, there's a number of things, you know. I think, uh, you know, the easy answer is my parents both went to HBCUs. My mother went to Talladega, my father went to Howard. You know, if it wasn't for HBCUs, they would have never gone to college. You know, um, you know, it was funny because you know somebody was talking earlier and and you know saying this person went to an HBCU, this person went to HBCU, this was. But if you look at before 1965, everybody went to HBCUs. <laughs> you know, there was no other option, other, right? There was no other place to go. Right. You know, like I want, I say, you know, like Harvard might have had two, Yale might have had two, and Oberlin might have had five. But that was about it. You know, there was no, you know, there was no other place to go, um, and so everybody went to HBCU. So, you know, I thought it was a really important story. Um, I am kind of drawn to stories about institutions and movements rather than f uh, films about, you know, the great man or great woman. Mm -hmm. You know, I just think that that's what those, that to me is, is just, you know, more exciting uh, to do films about, you know, institutions or movements, you know, like the Freedom Summer, the Freedom Rides. You know, Garvey is a film about Garvey, but it's really a film about the Garvey movement. Um, the Black Panthers, of course, and Tell Them We Are Rising. You know, you know we've had few institutions right. that have sustained us. I did a film called uh, The Black Press, Soldiers Without Swords about black newspapers. That was one of the institutions that we had that sustained us in, in a lot of ways. Um, we've had the black church, and uh, you know we've had black colleges, and so I think it was one of the things that sustained us, you know, over the years. And one of the differences between African Americans and Af people of African descent in so many other countries around the world. You know, we've had black colleges and universities. We had this other system right. to educate us that, that no other country had. You know, I like the way you describe the institutions and the movement because they also help us define periods of time and help us track. You know, when I was growing up, I would hear that every time an elder in the black community dies, so does parts of our history. And you're tracking the history. My daughter's nine years old, it's the first time she's ever seen some of this stuff. And so, why is this not only important to black America, but the rest of the country, including specifically white America? Why should they be paying attention? Well, one, I hope that it's a, you know, an entertaining story. I mean, right. that's what we're trying to do. You know, we're trying to mainstream these stories. We're trying to make stories that are not, you know, take your medicine, you know, here. The, here's a black college, you right. know, take it. Take open, it. Oh, let me open your mouth and stick that in there. Right. You know, uh, no, we're trying to tell stories that, that, that are entertaining, but these are stories about us. These are stories about, you, you know, what made, what made this country. You know, in a way, this film is the story of uh, history of the United States, but told through this lens of black colleges. You know, that, I mean, I think that's what's important, you know. You know, it, you know w what's important to us, I mean, what's important to us just can't be, you know, our little neighborhood, you know, who we are, right. you know. And, and I think, you know, look, how many films do we watch about white folks? A lot. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, I mean, that's why we're flocking to, that's why we're flocking <laughs> to see like, the Black, Black Panther. Panther. Because, like, this is the first time, you know, we've had a movie about us, you right. know. You know, and, and, and where we have a black director, and you know, we're not going to die in, in, in the first reel or the last, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody coming out on right, top. Right, right. <laughs> there's a chance that we might actually come out on top. All right, you right. Know? So, so I, I, you know, um, so 
just you know, just like we see film, and we will continue. You know, we will continue to see you know films about white folks, and you know, and and I think you know it, we don't go, oh, I'm going to see a movie about white people. I'm yeah. going to Star Wars. Well, some of us do, but right. you know, <laughs> but, so so I think it's important that you know that that we see films, you know, all different kinds of films. You know, that, yeah, that, I agree, and I think there's entertainment value, but. This film brought up some serious points, you know, and when I found out we were going to have this conversation, you know, I started talking to people and a lot of people, you know, brought some interesting topics to me and I wanted to impact some of those because I think I wanted to bring some other perspectives to the table. And one of the perspectives is, is some people may argue that uh, HBCUs may not necessarily be needed anymore, right? Because they were needed then. And do we still need them? Are they relevant? Can small colleges with different business models and smaller bottom lines survive? And why should we care? Um, so how do you respond to that? Because you had a lot packed into that. Right. Well, I mean, I, I think one, you know, you know, uh, so many of, of uh, black colleges and universities are, are really, you know, viable institutions. You know, um, it's almost like you know we we talk about them sometimes, like you know, it's it's like those Booker T. Washington pictures, you know, with a guy on the roof with a hammer and a nail and some boards, you right. know, building these, you know, you know, schools. I mean, you know, I, I just was at, you know, did a tour of black colleges. I was at FAMU. It's got eight hundred, I mean, eight thousand students. You know, uh, my son just started at Georgetown. You know, FAMU is the same size. As, as Georgetown, you know, you know, we all heard of Georgetown. Nobody's saying should Georgetown. Should we do away with Georgetown? Right. Georgetown is a Catholic university. Should we do away with Catholic universities? Hey, that's a good idea. Let's just do away with Catholic universities. We have Jewish universities. Let's do away with them. So, I mean, people aren't asking that question. I think also, you know, in, until uh, we have a country where the playing field is even for every kid, for every kid going into first grade you know, through, you know, school, through junior high, through high school, until we have that, then we need black colleges and universities. You know, in, in some ways, so many of them serve the same function that they always serve, which is to, to, to take people, this, the, the, the function that they serve for my father, right. right, which is to take them out of, out of, out of poverty and, and move them up, you know, in, into a viable, you know, middle class life. That's what they, they do. They also are, are very nurturing institutions, which is very different, you know. Right, the young lady talked about being somewhere where she was the majority. Yeah. Right? Well, you know, and that, and that's something that, you know, I, I, I actually was, was outside the, the, the auditorium when, when, when they said that, uh, you know, and um, I could hear people, people laugh, you know, and she said, they look like you. Right. Oh, they look like you. Because, you know, we all know what that means. You know, I was at a screening, you know, a couple of weeks ago, it was, it was a screening, it was mostly white folks, and I said, you know, how many people in here have, have ever been in a room where you're the only white person in the room? And like one person raised their hand, okay? So how many black people in here have been in the room where they're the only black people? Oh, everybody! <laughs> surprise, surprise. And when you see one, you get that nod and you feel good. I see you, brother. Surprise, surprise, surprise. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, there's also that, 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 that function that, that, that they serve, you know, which is, um, you know, they are our only safe black intellectual space. You know, that's why, you know, Martin Luther King went to an HBCU. <laughs> that's why the Freedom, Freedom Summer, Freedom Rides, you know, started at HBCU. That's why the sit-ins started at HBCU. That's why Black Lives Matter took hold, you know, in a lot of ways at HBCUs because, you know, it, it's a place where, you know, young black people can sit together and talk about their lives. And, and nobody's like, why are all those black people sitting around talking to each other? <laughs> you know, like, there's, no, there's none of that. You know, also, it's a place where, you know, you know that you succeed or fail um, because of your intellect. And, you know, it's not because of your color. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not because of your color. Let me just mm -hmm. add to that real quick. Because, you know, one of the most insidious things about racism is the vast majority of times you don't know, right? You don't know why you failed the class. You don't know why you didn't get the job. You don't know why you didn't get the apartment. You don't know these things. And what happens is, you know, you either, you know, build a wall around yourself to deal with it, or you end up like the brother on the street, you know, talking to yourself mm -hmm. because you don't know. So then you know, why? Right, right. But when you're at a black college, you, you, one thing you do know that it's, it's not, not because that. you're black. It's not, that. <laughs> it's not because you're black. You know. 
uh, one, I want to go back into the film and dig into a, a part that was really profound for me when I was watching it the first time with my wife. And it was your assessment of Booker T. Washington and the comparison and ideology and thinking between him and W.E.B. Du Bois. And it made me wonder, um, you know, about today. Is that contrast of thinking still here? And, you know, where you were taking us as a filmmaker with that and how we should be thinking about that today? You know, I, I, I'm not sure. One of the most surprising things for me, uh, you know, it, with this film and, and like touring the film around it and, and going, you know, to, to uh, black colleges and black audiences is how much, you know, back and forth we've had about our portrayal of, of Booker T. Washington. You know, and, and so finally, at, you know, as we were ending, getting near the end of the tour, I was getting mad and I just said, <laughs> I just said, look, I stand by what I said in the film. I really don't want to talk about it. Yeah. You know, if you want to go back to the days of Booker T. If you want to argue that Booker T was right, I mean, I don't know what to tell you. Booker T was very plain in what he said. It wasn't like, you know, you could make excuses for it and say, oh, he was in Alabama and that's why he had to do it. But it doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter why you do things. It matters what you do. And it happened. Yeah. And that's yeah. history, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm glad you, you, you said that because there are a lot of beautiful anecdotes throughout the film. What was your favorite story that was lifted up? You know, I, I like that moment where that girl says they look like you, or they look like you. I mean, I, I, I love that moment because it, it's, it's just a subtle moment. And, 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 you know, it's like you either get it or you don't, you know. Um, and, and, I mean, there's just a moment where they're talking about um, uh, Charles Hamilton Houston and, uh, and Thurgood Marshall going to the South, and where the guy says, you know, they had a still camera, a typewriter, and they had a movie camera and it just clicks in. It's just like this moment, you know. It's just little moments like that, you know, we cut to, to the footage and you see this footage that they actually shot, you know, down, down in, 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 in the South, in the Deep South. Um, it's just something about, you know, film is made up of little moments. It's not like, you know, big moments. It's not like we're gonna have, you know, uh, you know, the Black Panther flying <laughs> down out from out, uh, you know, come down, you know, it's made out of little moments and, and, and they, they hopefully add up to something. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's really important, you know, to look back at history. You know, the theme of our Project 67 was looking back to move forward. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that that's something that you're helping us do. Uh, you're grounding us in that history. Um, one of my frat brothers I talked to when he found out I was interviewing, he said, please integrate this question. And this was a great question. I want everyone to think about this. He said, how do I overcome the stigma of HBCUs being Less, being viewed as lesser of academic institutions than predominantly white institutions. I've been fighting my entire career to justify my education coming from an HBCU. I'm an engineer and I struggle with that every day. I hear you, you know, but on some level, who cares? You know what I mean? You cannot live your life like that. You know, um, one of the first jobs I got out of film school, you know, I got a job as, as, a, as a production assistant and I, you know, I was working this job and then I was looking through the files or something and I found out that this was a job that was held for a minority person, you know. And at first I was pissed, you know. I was yeah. like, oh, yeah. what, what, you know. And then I was like, when they gave me my paycheck, I was like, yeah, you know, I'm getting paid. I'm, I'm getting a chance to, to work in film, to do what I want to do. You know, and fine. You know, I'm glad I'm here, and, and I'm not gonna, you know, stress about about that, about why they hired me. You know, I'm just gonna make sure that they're never sorry they hired me. You know, and that I they promote me on, and I get to do what I want to do here. I can't be bothered by 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 that kind of stuff, and I don't think you can can be bothered. You know, you you know. Black people that went to, to HBCUs, you know, you know what the what those institutions mean and what they mean to you. Mm -hmm. And I found that, you know, traveling around around the country, you know, there's this whole network and there's a lot of HBCU graduates who do very, very, very well, you know. Yeah. Very well, you know. Um, you know, and, and there's studies that say that they do better than anybody else, you know? There's studies that say they do better than anybody else, and partially it's because of not only, you know, the, the what you learn, you know, it's not just ABC two plus two, but it's, it's, it's what you learn about who you are, 
and what you learn about your history and what you learn about the, the, the pride, you know, and what you learn from that nurturing when, you know, people, you know, who've been through the same thing as you, you know, your professors, you know, look at you and say, you know, you can do it. You know, that's what happened to my father. You know, like he was, he was like I say, he was the first person in his, his family graduated high school. I and mean, he got to Howard and the professor pulled him aside and said, man, you know, you, you, you know, you're bright, man. Stop joking around. Right. You know, you can do this. You got to take it seriously. You know, and it changed his life. That's special. I hope we don't lose that ever, ever. Yeah, yeah. And to your point, he also sent me a stat and said top th uh, the top three to five HBCUs actually outrank or are literally comparable to major universities, including some of our local Big Ten schools. Fact check that if you want to, but thank you for that point. Um, <laughs> you know, as, as you were talking and, and, and I listened to you, uh, the thing that I, I like about filmmakers is they're, they're, they're unapologetic. It's art. It's not his job to give us the solutions, right? It's your job to give us the information. You do your research, you talk to people, and hopefully they're helping to tell that story. Was there anything that surprised you that you learned throughout this film? Uh, you know, the whole, the whole thing was surprising to me. The whole, the whole process, everything I, I, I learned was surprising. I think, you know, one of the things that I always think about is how central um, the students have been at HBCUs in leading the institutions. You know, that's, that's a theme that you see over and over again in this film. You know, from the Fisk students in the 20s rising up to the sit-in students, you know, um, you know uh, to the girl who's part of Black Lives Matter. You know, so many times, you know, it's the students. And, and, and you know, I, I hope that that continues. You know, we need this, the students, you know, to lead us. You know, it's a lot of times the administration, you know, they're there and they're there to protect the students. You know what I'm saying? When I did a film called Freedom Riders and, and it was led by HBCU students students at Fisk and Tennessee State. And when they said they wanted to join the Freedom Rides, they were going to go continue the Freedom Rides. The administration said, you know, you can't go. You know, no, 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 don't go. You know, but that's because it was dangerous. Right. And they and their 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 job is to get those kids not only educate them, but get them home safe. But, you know, but the students went anyway. And I think it's important that, that students, you know, realize that they have power and use that power and use that power for change. We we need that. Yeah, I mean, and they did all of that back in the day without hashtags and social media. Right. And they were organized. They had their watches synchronized. <laughs> I thought that was great. So, so here, here, here's the one tough one. We know that um, a lot goes into filmmaking, and we know that you probably have way more footage than actually ends up in the final cut. But people were calling me, like, in their 30s and 40s, and some of them in their 50s, and was like, what happened to the 80s and the 90s? We need an explanation. I said, you know, there's a lot that goes into that, but I'll give the brother a chance to answer that. Okay, 90 minutes. That's my answer. We had 90 minutes. I figured that was we the case. We had 90 minutes, and you know, we knew that there were, look, there were things that we couldn't talk about. There were schools that we couldn't talk about. We knew that, you know, and we said, okay, you know, we're gonna make this film, and we're gonna take that weight. You know, and, and, and we've had, you know, and the only, only pushback we've had has been jokingly. Yeah. You know, people will come up to us and say, you know, well, you know, you didn't talk about pra Prairie View, but I love to film anyway. <laughs> you know, you know, and, and that's what that's what we get. But you know, we just we just had to had to kind of at some point say, okay, this is we have to make a film that that it tells a story and is entertaining. Um, the 80s and the 90s, we, you know, it was kind of like we could have, we could have done that. We thought a lot about it. We thought about uh, a different world, you know. And, and so, and they all were a yeah, lot and of so, the stuff. And so and inspired about us. That, that kind of, you know, I I increase in enrollment and that inspiration that that they got from from there. But um, you know, we just we just didn't, didn't have time. But you know, I I think that's the beauty sometimes of films. You know, you know, maybe it's our job to help finish that story and, and have the dialogue and, and, and the good discourse and, and really talk about things and keep the momentum going, right? Because ultimately, I'm sure that there's something that you want people to take away from a film like this, right? You know, no. I mean, there's, there's nothing that I want people, there's not so like you, one you thing. You want them to love it's it. Not, it's not one thing that I'm like, yeah. you know, his, this, this film is made for this purpose. purpose. You know, it's not, it's not like that. You know, it's more that, that we're telling you a story, it's made for a lot of purposes. You know, so, and whatever you get from it, hopefully that's, that's one of the things we wanted you to get from it. You know, uh, no, so we're not like thinking of like one thing, like this is, you know, what, what we want you to get. I think, I think it's bigger than that. And, mm -hmm. and what, what, whatever you take from it, we're happy. You know, um, one of the things for me, you know, is, is when we made the murder of Emmett Till, 
uh, we, we premiered the film at, at the Sundance Film Festival, and they have a, 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 a thing where they bring high school kids in, like from, from you know, Salt Lake City to see a film, and they chose Emmett Till as one of them because he was you know, high school age. And uh, they bring these high school kids in. They're 98% white kids. You know, you know, uh, uh, Utah's 80% Mormon, so I guess they were 80% Mormons. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and they loved. They gave the film a standing ovation and the whole thing. And this is the premiere, so we didn't know how people were going to react. And they're walking out, and this one 17-year-old white girl says to me, "That was good." <laughs> That's all you need. I, I mean, I'm telling you that story because I remember. Yeah. I, it's not like I'm making, I make. I remember that. I mean, that was like, wow, you know, that's what I wanted. You know, that was good. So, I mean, you know, if she if she thought that film was good, then she learned a whole lot. You know, she learned a whole lot about you know the way this country was, what Mississippi was, what Chicago was. You know, what 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 could happen to a a, a black boy? You know, from uh, Chicago in Mississippi. She learned a whole lot, and and just by saying that was good, I knew she understood a whole lot more than she understood when she walked in that door. Yeah, I think that's excellent. Well, we, another round of applause. <laughs> I just think that that's excellent. You know, you've done a lot of different documentaries. You talked about Emmett Till. You talked about Freedom Riders. But I was most surprised when I saw Jonestown. <laughs> and and I, I thought to myself, why Jonestown? Why, why did you pick that one? Um, you know, I mean, one of the things I, I, I've, I've tried to do is change up what I do, you know, from film to film. So, you know, the, so the film we did right before Telling Me Arising about black colleges was the Black Panthers, you know, and, and so they're, they're, they're two very different films. You know, Jonestown, uh, we thought was, it was an incredible story. Um, Jonestown, I think uh, People's Temple was 80% black. You know, um, and, and we just thought it was an amazing story, uh, you know, of, of people who wanted something different, you know, um, and really, you know, the story that we knew um, as the general public was very different from what, what actually happened, you know, and so we really thought it was a story that, that was really, that was really worth, worth telling. Um, um, you know, and, and part, of, part of making films is, you know, you want to tell stories that you can tell, you know, if you're doing a historical documentary. You know, one of the reasons why we, we loved uh, the idea of doing a uh, film about black colleges was we realized that there were all these great pictures and footage that these, that these schools had that nobody had ever seen before, you know. So, you know, we, we you know, you see uh, women graduating in 1885, you know, and who, who a lot of them were probably born enslaved, you know, and you see them all, how proud they are in those, those great pictures that the schools had. So, um, you know, it's partially, you know, you want to tell stories that, that you can tell. And we thought Jonestown, there was just incredible, incredible uh, footage, and there were, the people were still alive. Mm. And the people had lived through this, this trauma that, that, you know, is just unimaginable. Uh, to us, you know, um, and that it, it would just make it a great story that, that also had a, had a real moral for us, you know. We felt in making the film that it was partially about, you know, one thing that we want as human beings is to be part of something that's bigger than ourselves, you know. Um, what happens when you, when you don't speak up, when you see something that's wrong? You know, if you don't speak up immediately, and you get sucked into this crazy drama that they got sucked into. Uh, you know, all of those things and more, we thought that's what the story was and that it would make a, 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 a really interesting film. That's deep. <laughs> that's really deep. You know, you, you, you do more than make films, right? There's a lot of other work that you do with the foundation yeah. and whatnot. Talk about a, a little bit about that. Yeah, so we have uh, Firelight Media. So Firelight Films is, is our company that really produces films and, and it's kind of a for-profit company that produces films. And then we have Firelight Media, which is nonprofit and we have what we call the Documentary Lab, and we mentor uh, filmmakers. Um, we mentor f between 15 and 20 filmmakers at any one time to get their films made and, 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 and done and on the air. And We've been incredibly successful. We've been going on for, I don't know, 15 years now, something like that, 10, 15 years. Um, we, and, and, and it's just been an incredible program. Uh, we had uh, the opening night film at Sundance in 2017. One of our former dire directors, uh, won Best Director at Sundance in 2017. Um, we won a couple of Emmys. We have two films that'll be in Tribeca 
film festival in a couple months. Um, we've just been really, really successful. And part of that is because there's a lot of filmmakers of color, of color out there, you know, who, who are really smart and really right. good filmmakers and just need a hand up. So we provide them uh, mentoring and try to, you know, look, they let me get my foot in the door, so I'm holding it open as much as I can. Yeah, that's, that's really important. That's really important. How are we doing on time? <laughs> I just want to make sure. So you, you talk about kind of like the next generation. And you know, one of the things I like to do when I kind of pivot through a conversation is talking about, you know, where do we go from here? That's kind of like the standard. But you know, in your mind with a story like this, and based on the feedback that you got from all of the interviews and all of the anecdotes, what was the, the notion that you got? Because you know, you hear Kendrick Lamar come on, we're going to be all right. But what does that mean when we say we're going to be all right? Like, what does that mean when you walk out the door, right? What vibe did you get from that? For, well, I mean, I, th I think the film, you know, one of the reasons why we like the story and we like the name Tell Them We Are Rising is because it gives a feeling of where we are in the film, you know, and we're going to be all right. I think that that also gives a feeling of where we are as a people, you know. You know, I mean, we're living in a crazy time right now, but we're going to be all right. Yeah, you know, that's it's how... It's real that, crazy. And, 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 but, you know, as somebody said, yeah, this is really bad, but we've seen a lot worse, <laughs> you know. <laughs> we've seen a lot worse, you know, and, 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 and I will challenge anybody to the death on that one. And, you know, we've seen a lot worse than this, and then we're going to be all right. Um, and, and one thing we, we, we loved about, about that was, you know, the film starts, you know, in a time of enslavement when African Americans could, could not, by law, right. be educated. They could not be educated by law, and that was in every state in the South. There were some states in the North, I think Ohio was one of them, where, where you had to get, it said every black person that can read and write has to get out of the state by sundown. You know? I mean, sundown like, town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was sundown state. You know, yeah. like, like you couldn't read or if, if if you if you couldn't read or write, it was okay. You know, if you were uneducated. But you know, there were there were laws like that. So um, you know, we start the film there, and we end the film with this montage of different graduations and yeah, and the joy and, and 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 the love that you see in these young people who are graduating from college. You know, and so we thought those were great bookends for the film. You know, whether as a, as a, as a viewer, you know, you tie those things together and say, oh, it started here, now it ended here. You know, you don't have to do that for it to be, for it to still be meaningful. Yeah, it seemed like it got to a point where the story was just telling itself. Uh -huh. I almost felt like, man, I wonder if he just kind of sat back and said, <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to take my hands off the wheel and just let this evolve because it felt like it was just building to that point. Well, thank you, but yeah, <laughs> no. Yeah, it didn't happen like that. No. See, that's what we want to hear. We want to hear the real stuff. Like, no. what did it really take? No. Was uh, it that hard? Uh, yes, this was, uh, this was, this was, this was, uh, this was probably the hardest film I ever made because there's no story. You know, there's no story. This, this film covers 170 years or something, you know, in a, an hour and a half, you know. You look, look, the Black Panthers goes from 1966 to 1972. Right. It's six years, you know, right. and everything in there, you know, so they form the Black Panthers, you know, Eldridge Cleaver joins, Huey gets shot in the shootout, little Bobby Hutton, you know, it's like uh, certain things have to happen. In, in this film, you could have made it, you know, a hundred different ways. You know, you could still make a hundred different films about those those stories that you're talking about. You know, that, right. that weren't in there. They, and and you could make, uh, hopefully, somebody will, some other people will. You can make a bunch of great films. But you know, it, so this was really hard. We had to figure out what stories we could tell, what stories to tell. You know, what stories kind of gave it that through line. And the fact that you said, you know, it seems like, uh, you know, I like my hands were off and that thing was just steering itself. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, that, no, that's the greatest compliment you could, you could possibly give me because one of the things I try to do as a filmmaker is get out, is get out of the way right. and, and make the, and let, I, I want the film to seem like it's telling its own story. I don't want it to be, you know, well, there's Stanley Nelson again, right, you, know, right, right. you know, putting himself in this story. I mean, right. this story is too big. This story is too great. I, you know, what a, what a, what a black college does have to do with me, you know, um, you know, that it's a bigger story than me. Well, I thank you. I got one last question. We are in the Motor City. We are in the D to 313. What's your last message to Detroit? Because you've been great to us. You've been at Wayne State. You've been at the DIA. Right. You're at the Wright Museum. What do you say to Detroit? Yeah, I say Detroit is rising, man. Detroit, yeah. Detroit is rising.
you know, uh, Detroit, Detroit, Detroit has been great to me, you know, and, 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 and I just had a great time. You know, tomorrow I'm going to kind of take a tour and just drive around the city. I couldn't do that until now because of the snow. Right. <laughs> right. Well, you know, it was, it, was, it was a blizzard in the morning and then the sun was out right. That's Michigan right, for you. Right, right. Everybody, Stanley Nelson, thank you, brother. Right. Great film. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Appreciate it.